Very good. Here we are, part 11 of the reading and commentary of Les Fisher's book and study of the socialist response to anti-Semitism in the German imperial state amongst the second internationalists. And uh, this is uh, essentially a critique of uh, the Marxist current of thought, not necessarily Marx even, but it is also an evaluation of Zero Judenfrage by Marx of 1943-1944. So this is getting into the most problematic aspect of uh, Marxist political theory, which has uh, quite a problem with dealing with national identity, as do the uh, anarchist uh, currents of thought, except for Rudolf Rocker. Well, basically, that's a summarization of you know the state of the state of dysfunction that we uh, are subjected to in the quote unquote left. Uh, okay, now we're going to go share and find that work to continue the reading. And here we go. This is uh, Dr. Abraham Weisfeld speaking, doctor in political science from the University of the Quebec of Montreal. And now we're going to read from page 91 of Zerjuden Fraga. And uh, the address for the, for the digital copy of this book so that you can uh, read together with me is uh, in the link that I'm going to be providing here in the uh, chat and in the comment. First of all, I'm going to put it into the chat. If I can get there, no. I'll put it in the chat afterwards. Because we're in share mode. Okay. Now, Mayrings was the principal writer for dealing with a so-called Jewish question in the Second International. So, Mehring's specific spin on Zer Judenfrage. Although Mehring's uh, stance was generally in keeping with the consensus communists, there was one point at which Mehring's introduction to Zer Judenfrage really did go beyond it. He, really, he already mentioned appreciation of Bauer and his young Hegelian milieu clearly represented an innovative twist to the prevalent discourse. This does not autom automatically put him at odds with the attitudes pre prevalent among his peers, of course. He could equally well just have been the first among them to spill out this particular implication of the consensus communists. One thing is quite clear, though. According to Mehring, Marx himself had shared this appreciation, and this, is, and this was simply not true. As we saw earlier, Marx's very point of a departure in Zero Judenfrage had been his rejection of the conflation of right and morality, implied by Bauer's line of argument. Yet, most so socialists, their claims notwithstanding that they shared Marx's stance, subscribed to this conflation of right and morality. In this connection, we first came across Mehring's surprising appreciation of Bauer's original stance. Early on in his discussion of Zero Judenfrage, Mehring, in fact, claimed that, quote, as far as Bauer's conceptualization went, Marx acknowledged its consistency, unquote. This is a highly misleading formulation, to say the least, and it's quite clear that Mehring was determined to bend over backwards to, to demonstrate that not only Bauer, but Marx, too, had shared his own concept for the Philo-Semites. Mehring began his discussion of the second part of Zer Judenfrage with an account of the emergence of the Jewish question. Much as the Jewish money might, Jewish Giltmacht, extended itself with the capitalist mode of production and made itself indispensable for the governments, he explained, the dogged resistance that absolutism and feudalism pitted against the revolutionary transformation of bourgeois society precluded the political emancipation of the Jews. Of all the sins committed by the governments of the Vormats era, however, this one, relatively speaking, stirred the mass of the nation least. In fact, during the 1840s, 
a fair number of radicals had increasingly come to see Jewish emancipation as a test case for the ability of the Prussian regime to reform more generally. Their support for the cause of emancipation may have been feeble, and they indeed readily abandoned it when push came to shove. Yet it's hard to see how the Bauer controversy should have drawn so much attention in the first place had the issue been one of such indifference as Mehring suggested. It was certainly no matter of indifference to the opponents of Jewish emancipation, as Bauer's Die Jugendfrage clearly demonstrated. On balance, it is probably fair to say that the mass of the nation, far from being not being stirred by the regime's refusal to grant emancipation, was stirred by the possibility that the Jews might be emancipated after all. <laughs> the opposite. <clears throat> Be that as it may, why then, if we stick with Mehring's scheme of things for the moment, did the mass of the nation find it hard to get worked up about this particular sin on the part of the regime, i.e. the refusal to emancipate the Jews? Because, quote, the murderous role that Jewish usury had played in the dissolution of the feudal order had aroused an inordinate amount of hatred against Jewry, and not just amongst the peasants and artisans sucked dry by usury. It was because the mass of the nation hated the Jews then, and hated them for good reason, quote, uh, that it had supposedly been indifferent to the fact that the regime would not grant them equal rights. Ah, they were upset that the regime was not indifferent to the Jewish emancipation because they were opposed to Jewish emancipation, in other words. Okay, that makes it clear. Why had the Jews nonetheless been emancipated in the end? Clearly, democratic pressure from below cannot be the reason, since the mass of the nation was not inclined to demand a reform of this kind from the regime. Why then would the regime take this step if pressure from below had not forced it to do so? Because Jewry or to be more specific, Jewry as a class won far too much power, quote, Jewry as a class won far, far too much power as a result of the economic development for it not to take into the constraints that still fenced in its actual rule, unquote. This had placed the Jewish question firmly on the agenda. Mm -hmm. But it is well known that the vanguard of our classical literature and philosophy was not exactly well disposed towards the Jews, unquote, Mehring explained. Yet he had to concede, of course, that this was held true, quote, with the sole exception of Lessing, their bourgeois representative, unquote. Lessing was one of those topics, Mehring, <clears throat> that Mehring had acquired or certain expertise on that he recycled relentlessly. Now, as is well known, Lessing's stand towards a jury, however problematic on its own terms, was singularly positive compared to the attitudes prevalent among his contemporaries. One can well imagine how this irked Mary, given his admiration for Lessing. One of the mantras dearest to his heart was therefore the clarification that Lessing's friendliness towards Jews, quote, had nothing in common with the philo-Semitism of today, unquote. It was motivated exclusively by the abstract insight that, quote, the political suppression of the Jews violated the bourgeois Weltansklung. That the political suppression of the Jews violated the bourgeois Weltanschung, for it was hardly as if the Jews had anything to show for themselves that might have merited granting them equal rights. At this point, Mehring's argument began to parallel one on which Bauer had placed the utmost emphasis. And Bauer says, Jewry did not contribute to the glorious work of our great intellectuals and poets, Denker and Dichter. Moses Mendelssohn was anything but a path-breaking thinker, and is precisely the commendable part of his, of his activities, his attempts to cultivate the Jews, that demonstrates how remote Jewry was from the intellectual life of the nation, according to Bauer. Mehring argued. 
Bauer himself had gone out of his way to emphasize that a Jew, as a Jew, could make no contribution to the development of the arts and sciences or scholarly endeavors. Why not? Because these were activities that transpired in and through history. Jewry, however, was not only stood outside history. It was fundamentally categorized precisely by the fact that its very existence set it against the course of history. The Jew led, quote, a war of annihilation, Wörterlungungskrieg, against history. And this war of annihilation, in fact, amounted to a graver, quote, a graver crime than the war his ancestors, ancestors were required, required to lead against the Canaanite hordes. <laughs> oh, that's enough. This is getting bizarre. Okay. That's enough for this evening. This is the Vanguard Circle Forum of the Jewish Socialist Bund, and this is the continuing reading of Les Fisher's study and book on the socialist response to anti-Semitism in the German Imperial State, amongst the Second Internationalists. Okay, see you soon.